Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video of the waste program biology. And um, uh, I hope everyone had a good vacation, a good summer break. I know some of you got uh, gotten sick. That's why you guys aren't here. But uh, hopefully it isn't anything too major, guys, and you 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 recover uh, fairly quickly. That way you guys can come back, right? And um, hopefully you saw the videos, uh, the previous videos, right, on enzyme activity and just the general concepts of uh, enzymes. We're going to continue today on uh, ATP and photosynthesis and cell respiration, right? So we're essentially on chapter 10, and we've gone through sections one through four. And um, uh, today is going to be a relatively uh, short video that I usually make, uh, basically going over the concepts of ATP and photosynthesis. So uh, it shouldn't take too long, right? And I'm making it more over as a video so you guys can have as a reference hopefully you guys are watching the videos um these are some of the topics that are going to be evaluated more in the um in the unit two examination and in the topic test so make sure you you study and then when you guys come back you can ask me any questions on the summer work and also on this video all right so let's get let's get to it here Okay, so um, you should be familiar with ATP. Um, you know, cells require energy to do work, right? Every chemical reaction or the majority of chemical reactions that occur in um, in the cell and in, in the organism itself, right, require energy, right? And the major way in which uh, the cell uses energy or, or um, obtains energy is by ATP, right? So ATP is a um, energy carrying molecule, right? And it's um, the main actually energy carrying molecule uh, for the cell to carry, to carry out um, um, cellular reactions, right? Basically metabolism. And um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And you can see the general structure here. And if you remember, or if you've, um, um, yeah, if you remember from the pre-waste phase or um, uh, in the previous videos um, and lectures that I've talked about, you know how DNA is composed of four nucleotides, uh, which is adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, right? Uh, ATP is actually a similar structure to those nucleotides. So it contains a nitrogenous base, basically the A, right, adenine, and a uh, five-carbon sugar, which is ribose, right? With the exception here now that instead of having that phosphate, uh, just one phosphate, here it has three phosphates, right? So <clears throat> these are designated by alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, you don't need to know that level of detail for the waste program, but just know that there's three phosphates, a sugar, and... Um, adenine, which when composed of this structure is basically a adenosine, right? Uh, and um, yeah, so this is the primary molecule that essentially carries energy, chemical energy in the form of, uh, you know, in the chemical bonds and in particular that third phosphate that we're going to take a look at. And, uh, you know, how do we even charge uh, ATP to begin off to, to have so much energy? Ultimately, as you guys know already, um, energy comes from sunlight, right? That solar radiant energy that is that is um, being propelled from the sun into the uh, onto the earth, right? Plants absorb that energy, basically uh, um, uh, convert it to a chemical form that we can use, uh, essentially photosynthesis, right? And photosynthesis converts that sunlight energy into a chemical energy, into another form of energy, right? The organic compounds that we know as glucose, right? And um, then uh, these are basically the autotrophs, right? And then of course we consume these autotrophs and process the glucose and burn the glucose, right? Break down that gluco glucose and extract the energy from that via another process that we're gonna take a look at called cell respiration ultimately forming ATP, right? So uh, ATP is our go-to molecule, if I can say, to produce and carry 
and um, uh, play with energy, if I can say, right? So energy is carried throughout the cell in the form of ATP. And more specifically, right, it's that third phosphate group that generally is carrying the most amount of energy through the chemical bonds that actually make it relatively unstable and easily broken and attached to other molecules, right, where you have an energy transfer, a liberation of energy to do work in other machinery, molecular machinery, right? And uh, once you consume ATP, right, it turns into, and you consume that third phosphate, right, that ATP turns into ADP, right? It's because you lose a phosphate, you just have these two remaining phosphates, and now you have something called adenosine diphosphate, right? So because you have only two uh, phosphate groups now, plus that little phosphate that basically detached and the liberation of energy. So if you were to see this in a chemical equation form, it'll look something like that. ATP uh, yields ADP plus a phosphate plus energy, right? And these are reversible reactions, meaning that they can go in both ways. As you can see in this little, um, little diagram of this ATP to ADP cycle, right? So let's say you, you have this ATP molecule, right? It's, it's energized. It just was made from cell respiration, right? And then it's going to be used by some other molecular process, right? And what happens is that that high energy bond on the third uh, phosphate is basically broken and that release of phosphate and um, uh, that liberation of phosphate also liberates energy. And that energy is basically absorbed or consumed in other cell uh, activities, right? Uh, so the cell can maintain its its um, maintain itself, right? Basically, to give you an, an example, a more discrete example of what we've seen already is active transport. If you guys remember the proteins that are embedded on the cell membrane um, to pass molecules to a high concentration, a high concentration gradient from a low concentration gradient via uh, ATP usage, right? Um, basically sodium potassium pumps, um, if you remember that, right? So in any case, right, you have energy that is being consumed by ATP. And that little phosphate, it's still lingering around. It's floating around there, and it needs to be basically re-integrated um, into ADP again. But in order to do that, you do need to input some form of energy, right, to kind of merge them back together to create that triphosphate. So how do you do that? What where, where do you go to do that? Is essentially, um, you know, energizing in the form of cell respiration, right? So rest cell respiration is that process that essentially reforms ATP from ADP and phosphate. Okay, um, and also photosynthesis can also introduce energy and phosphates into the system, right? So they're both helpful in reestablishing ATP in this in this ATP, ADP cycle. Okay, so um, in general, ATP is our go-to kind of battery molecule, energized in the form of ATP and depleted in the form of ADP, but they could get re-energized, right? So um, that's our main energy carrying molecule. There are other molecules that you do need to remember, right, that carry energy and it's, essentially uh, NADH and FADH2. These are two um, uh, energy carrying molecules that more specifically carry electrons. And we're gonna take a look at that in a bit, right? The last thing I want to mention in terms of uh, ATP is that anytime you have this process that you're having a phosphate that is coming in to rejoin ADP that is referred to as phosphorylation, okay? And um, more in general, if I can say, AD, anytime you have um, that phosphate uh, attaching to a substance, it's referred to uh, as ADP, uh, sorry, phosphorylation, okay? As phosphorylation. <clears throat> so remember that, uh, remember that per, uh, that um, word there, right? Uh, in general, you could mention cell respiration drives that reaction to create ATP for me, um, ADP and inorganic phosphate or just phosphate. Um, 
but all in all, it's phosphorylation, okay? Um, like I mentioned before, ADH and FADH2 are other energy-carrying molecules in the form uh, um, that they carry electrons, right? And they also function as coenzymes during cell respiration, right? As you remember from the previous video on um, a, you know, factors that influence um, enzyme enzymatic activity is essentially coenzyme or cofactors, right? <clears throat> so, um, you know, what's the purpose of carrying electrons? We're going to see that in the electron transport chain. If you remember um, from the pre-waste uh, phase that we were studying, that we're going to get into in a little bit. Not as le that level of detail, but we'll still talk about it, okay? More specifically, right, so they carry electrons and they help transfer that energy, and not just electrons, actually hydrogen uh, uh, also, from one area um, within a particular organelle like the mitochondria or within the cell, right, uh, in general, uh, basically to, to move this form of energy around, okay? Generally, you'll see it the most in, in aerobic respiration, okay? So let's go to... Uh, photosynthesis. So having that said and understanding this concept of ATP, we can get into uh, these two processes, right? Photosynthesis and cell respiration that um, we'll just focus on photosynthesis today. All right. So if you saw the video and um, you went over the notes, right? Photosynthesis is a type of biochemical pathway that it, basically undergoes a series of reactions, right? Where you use a lot of enzymes to produce, uh, to make the products of reaction number one, then reaction number two uses a different enzyme and so forth and so forth. Basically a multi-step series of chemical reactions, ultimately to produce uh, two things. Glucose, a form of um, organic compounds by using inorganic substances, right? Water and carbon dioxide, um, via the use of light energy, right? Which is then converted into chemical energy, right? And um, uh, ultimately to produce, you know, uh, these organic compounds, basically glucose and oxygen, right? And we're going to see, you know, where do these uh, reactants come from and where are the products yielded in the, um, in the whole process of photosynthesis, right? If you see in this table, you do need to know specifically the, the chemical reaction of photosynthesis. If I were to ask you for the word equation, you would write something like this, carbon dioxide plus water um, yields glucose and oxygen via sunlight and the use of chlorophyll molecules, right? And uh, if you were to write the chemical equation, you would write um, you could write, this is the more specific form, right? But the simplified chemical equation is what I see internationally as being used, right? Six molecules of carbon dioxide plus six molecules of water yield one molecule of glucose plus six molecules of oxygen, right? And we're going to take a look where each of these forms and where each of these is being consumed, Right. A couple of things we do need to know is um, some concepts, some structures that you should be familiar with. Right. So the first one is basically chloroplasts, or the main one. Right. Where let me let me reiterate that the the main uh, organelle that is involved in photosynthesis is basically chloroplast. Right. Uh, this is a very special organelle that has pigments, many types of pigments called chlorophyll. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And um, it essentially, you know, captures light energy to um, process water and split water and collect the electrons and then uh, use those in a electron transport chain to yield um, um, ATP, all right, and make electron carriers like NADPH, all right. But um, just to get a little bit more detail on the structure of chloroplasts, which you do need to know, okay, uh, chloroplast, you can see one one um, diagram here of chloroplast, right? If you were to go inside the leaf and you were to zoom into the leaf, you would see particular cells. <clears throat> and within each individual leaf cell, right, you would see these little green organelles floating around. There's usually a lot in there. 
And um, that chloroplast that you see here is basically, you know, what we're going to be talking about. So zooming into chloroplast itself, it's a double membrane organelle consisting of an outer cellular membrane by phospholipid bilayer, same thing. And you also have an inner membrane, again, bilayer of the phospholipids. But then once you get inside that hollow sac, there's um, a whole system occurring, right? Primarily, you have these little discs, right? They're little flattened discs. They look like little pancakes, right? They're filled with jelly, if I can say, and, and um, strawberry jelly for the sake of this color. And these little flattened discs are called thylakoids, right? And they usually stack up, many of them stack up into what are called granum, okay? So you have your thylakoids. When you have many of these thylakoids together, they're called granum. And these little uh, discs are actually like the solar panels of the chloroplast. So they're the ones that are, are absorbing the sunlight. And they're basically embedded within, I forgot I say embedded, maybe, uh, within a fluid or they filled in, this whole sac is filled in uh, with a liquid called the stroma. And this is a fluid um, matrix, okay, a jelly-like fluid that is, um, it's very rich in proteins, right? It's very rich in, in enzymes and in nutrients, basically to do all that process of photosynthesis of the Calvin cycle of having all the enzymes and intermediates that you need to carry out photosynthesis, right? So it's it's very packed with um, um, with molecules, right? And enzymes in particular, okay? So again, right, some characteristics of chloroplast is double membrane, has a stroma and thylakoids, okay? So I think in terms of structure, that's all really you need to know, okay? And um, now the process of photosynthesis itself is broken down into two stages, right? Um, some textbooks refer to it as reactions, stages, right? Phases, it's, it's, could be used interchangeably, right? So the first one, uh, the first set of reactions is referred to as the light dependent reactions, right? Or the light dependent stage, right? Or the light reactions. And this occurs, and this is important to know, you know, where does it occur? It essentially occurs in the thylakoids, Okay. And basically the little the little pancakes, okay? <clears throat> and what happens here, now you do not need to know this level of detail, okay? Uh, let me move this so I can see the, the, the little diagram here. Uh, you do not need to know this level of detail here of the electron transport chain in its entirety, right? But what I want you to know is that within the thylakoid, all right. If you were to look at these little discs here and you were to zoom in to the membrane, you would see the system here, of many, many molecules and things like that embedded within the cell membrane. Right. And in particular, there's um, some that are called photosystems. And these photosystems are uh, the location where water comes in and gets split and gets into um, basically starts the, the, the light reactions. Okay, so just to give you an overview of what happens, chlorophyll absorbs light energy, okay? And when it absorbs light energy, it excites electrons and these electrons move down a cascade, if you remember, um, until ultimately they reach a, a, an electron carrier or, or, or recipient, right? But in this case, it's NADP+. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But... Uh, what I want you to understand, moreover, are these two things, right? What is being used? What is being produced? And in this case, right, in the first part of photosynthesis, energy basically splits water, okay? Within the, the, the chlorophyll molecules, they provide light energy. They excite electrons enough to split water, right? And um, using sunlight, water gets split into oxygen, right? electrons and hydrogen plus ions. So if you take a look at this little diagram here, water basically reacts with this uh, little complex here called a photosystem, 
You don't need to know photosynthesis system itself. And um, when it reacts, it basically splits into one oxygen molecule, but it so instantly reacts with another oxygen molecule that it makes O2, right? But you generally annotate it as half an oxygen um, uh, diatomic molecule, right? So half of O2 plus two H um, uh, hydrogen plus ions, okay? So we know where in the photosynthesis reaction, right? Water is used. It's used in the light dependent reactions, okay? And it's used to produce basically oxygen as a byproduct, okay? At the same time, it's producing electrons. These electrons, they go through a series of molecules and complexes on the membrane. And as they're moving from one to another, to another, to another, hydrogen plus ions are being pumped into one side of the thylakoid, basically the inner side of that pancake, right? And they're creating a concentration gradient where they are um, starting to um, produce or increase potential energy, right? Basically due to that concentration gradient. As you have enough hydrogen plus ions, you just due to that crowdedness, right? Hydrogen plus ions will shoot through a particular enzyme that you should know, right? Is ATP synthase. And the name tells you what it makes, which it makes, it synthesizes ATP, right? From potential energy to kinetic energy in, involving in um, that movement through that enzyme is enough energy to basically merge or, or um, connect together ADP plus phosphate, inorganic phosphate. So that's enough energy basically to provide that chemical bond in ADP and phosphate to turn into ATP. So you can create ATP from this first little reaction. Okay, so, um, but you don't, sorry, uh, you don't necessarily uh, see any electrons happening here. What occurs is that electrons, as they're passing down this cascade, the last acceptor of electrons, right, is basically NADP+, plus. okay? NADP+, plus, along with hydrogen plus ions, they merge together and produce NADPH, okay? So they react everything together to produce NADPH, okay? And then this goes along to... Uh, produce this molecule, okay? <clears throat> so then this is going to be used to produce, uh, to go to the, the next um, uh, the next reactions, which is the light independent reactions, okay? So just to summarize in this little paragraph here, you have ATP, right? It's formed at this stage. You have oxygen that is being formed at this stage along with electrons and hydrogen plus ions. And ultimately, you have NADP plus that is being transformed into that electron carrier that now it's energized, right? Because it has electrons and it has hydrogen plus ions embedded in it, okay? So uh, I mentioned early on that chlorophyll is the one that absorbs that light energy. It's a pigment molecule, right? But there are other types of pigment molecules, okay? Um, carotenoids are some other you know, types of pigment molecules. The xanthophils are other types. And chlorophyll are these pigment molecules that absorb basically the blue and red light out of the visible light spectrum, right? Keratinoids, xanthophils can absorb basically yellow and orange. Um, that's why when you see during the fall, when the leaves start dying, the chlorophyll starts breaking apart, right? Removing the green out of the plant, out of the leaves, Ultimately, that's why you see red and orangey colors, tones in the fall until, you know, they completely die out and fall to the floor, right? So uh, this is essentially what happens in light-dependent reactions, okay? Uh, in terms of products, I basically summarized here. You definitely need to know this, right? What are the products of the light reactions? It's essentially ATP, oxygen as a byproduct which essentially leaves the, the leaf, right? 
through the openings, the stomata. And the hydrogen plus ions and electrons, which ultimately get carried, um, um, get uh, collected by NADP plus to turn into NADPH. Okay, so make sure you understand that. All right. Uh, and then we go into the light independent reactions, and the name tells you what it is, you know, or the light independent uh, independent stage. And the, the yeah, the reaction tells you what it is or what occurs and what it needs or doesn't need. In this case, these reactions can occur without the need of light. All right. And this occurs in the stroma. All right. That little space, that fluid filled space, uh, basically the stroma there. Okay, so uh, what's occurring here? Again, you do not need to know this level of detail, but I just want to show you in terms of context, right? What is happening here? In this case, glucose is being produced by um, using carbon dioxide and the hydrogen plus ions that were made from the light dependent reactions, right? So, uh, and they're carried by NADPH, okay? Where do we get carbon dioxide? So if you take a look here, we get it from the environment, from the air, right? So we get water from the air. Basically, uh, plants are absorbing water from the soil, and we're getting carbon dioxide floating around in the air, right? So these two together, now you know where you get them and where they're being used, okay? To produce, in this case, carbon dioxide comes in to produce sugar, glucose. <clears throat> so... Uh, glucose is produced, again, like I mentioned before, uh, it's produced from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And that ATP that is being created from um, the light reactions is being used here, right? So you can refer to this as an anabolic reaction because you're getting from simple molecules to more complex molecules, right? And in this case, carbon is being stored into glucose. That process, that chemical process where a carbon is being um, added to a, a, an organic molecule, right, or to produce an organic molecule is referred to as carbon fixation, okay? And just to give you a sense here, very broad sense, you do not need to know this, right? Um, more specifically, the light-dependent uh, reactions are called, it's called the Calvin cycle. And what's happening here is that carbon dioxide is entering a series of um, uh, chemical reactions, right? Um, enzyme driven, right? And as it's emerging into the system and reacting with certain intermediate molecules, if I can say, right? It's creating different forms. And by using ATP, it's creating something called G3P, right? Now, ultimately, uh, if you notice these little black circles, they represent carbon atoms, right? In, in these intermediate molecules, okay? And in order for this to occur, for every three carbon dioxide, you make one of this three carbon molecule. So basically the cycle needs to occur twice before you can uh, make a whole glucose molecule because glucose is six carbons, right? I, again, you don't need to know this level of detail, but I just want you to know what's happening in this uh, in this um, um, scenario here, right? Ultimately, carbon dioxide, what, what you do need to know is that a carbon dioxide is being, um, um, if I can say, transferred, right? Um, and consuming ATP to produce glucose, okay? <clears throat> Now, uh, the amount of photosynthesis that occurs does change throughout the day because of the, of the availability of sunlight. So during daylight hours, right, chloroplast converts glucose to sucrose into basically a more stable form and a more stored form, right? So you have glucose turning into sucrose, a disaccharide, if you guys remember, into a very, very large molecule, which is a polysaccharide, okay? <clears throat> into a, a polysaccharide. So uh, whenever you need sucrose or glucose to be stored, right? It's not a good thing to have too much sugar stored and be, uh, sorry, uh, to have too much sugar moving around 
in the body, right? Um, or else the whole fluid within the plant will get will get too thick, right? And there will be no transportation. So um, you need to put it in a stored form, which is starch, right? So sucrose is the the in glucose itself, where sucrose is the most easiest form to be transported because it's basically a monomer or a very small uh, disaccharide. And then starch being the uh, most complex stored form. Okay. And they basically store starch in the vacuoles. If you take a look here, this is an electron micrograph of a chloroplast cell that, uh, sorry, of a plant cell that has many chloroplasts here that you can see in these dark red. Uh, sorry, dark green um, uh, areas there. And starch is basically stored in this whole pink area, right? In that vacuum. <clears throat> oh. Sorry about that. Let me kind of find my way. All right. So like I was mentioning before, um, you know, during the time of day, you know, a, a, uh, the rate of photosynthesis changes. And during daylight hours, you're having chloroplasts produce as much as glucose as it can. So photosynthesis is, is, is basically at its optimum, right? At nighttime, though, where you don't have no more sunlight, right? There's no, basically, there's no light reactions occurring, of course, because they're light dependent reactions. But you can still have um, cell respiration occurring and the carbon cycle, uh, uh, the Calvin cycle occurring because, um, you know, you can use the glucose that's, that was made, you can burn it up and you can produce ATP, right? You see here. Okay. So during daylight hours, you produce as much starch as you can. And then at nighttime, uh, starch could be used and burned to basically um, uh, produce ATP and, you know, uh, uh, sucrose could be transported to other areas of the cell, uh, of the plant body, right? Where it needs to do uh, uh, chemical reactions, basically ATP dependence and so forth, right? <clears throat> um, this idea of daylight hours, we're going to see in a lot more detail when we get into the physiological processes of the plant body. Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about for today is the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Uh, remember, as I mentioned before, um, anything that deals with factors, with things that influence the rate of something, you must know for the topic test. The you you should definitely understand that um, uh, it's something that you'll be evaluated on for the examination, right? And very very simple. Right. In this case, we have three things that three factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. OK, they're generally abiotic. And um, they can influence, you know, the rate of photosynthesis. And anytime you have one particular abiotic factor that restricts or restrains the rate of photosynthesis, independently of how much you have of other factors, it's referred to as a limiting factor. Okay, as a limiting factor, and in this case, you have three things that it that could affect um, the the photosynthesis rate. The first one is light intensity, as you see here. The second one is carbon dioxide availability concentration, and the third one is temperature. Okay, <clears throat> and let's take a look at at light intensity here. So you guys know already. I mentioned before, chlorophyll can absorb sunlight, right? It absorbs that light, so. If you have more sunlight, then that means that the electrons that are in these photosystems in the chlorophyll will get excited, right? And you'll be producing more ATP, more uh, of these NADPHs. All that rate will increase. That means the overall photosynthesis rate will also rate will also increase in general, right? But there comes a point where you have so much light intensity, the brightness of, of sunlight, that um, you can't increase the photosynthesis rate even if you wanted to, right? Because uh, 
all the chlorophyll molecules, you know, they get overly saturated. They need time to work. They need time for electrons to move around. They need time to process things. So you're going to reach a point that even though you're inputting more light intensity, right, the rate of photosynthesis will ultimately plateau, right? You're basically saturating. And all the molecules that are in this whole system are, 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 are busy, right? You, you don't want to overload the PC and it'll start to lag, right? So you basically plateau and that's the optimum amount of photosynthesis that you can um, provide, right? Uh, in terms of light intensity, okay? In a similar way, carbon dioxide also uh, works, right? <clears throat> you guys know that carbon dioxide is used in the Calvin cycle, light independent stage, to produce glucose, right? And again, you can be providing as much carbon dioxide as you can, but it does take time to be consumed. It does take time for carbon dioxide to get fixed, to create glucose, you know, from these intermediates in that cycle that I showed you. So true, at a certain extent, the higher the concentration, the reaction weight will increase, but you will reach a saturation point, right? Again, e even all the enzymes are being consumed. They need time to work, right? So um, as you increase carbon dioxide concentration, the rate of photosynthesis does increase until you reach an optimum. Okay, a saturation point. At that point, it doesn't matter how much carbon dioxide is floating around. Okay. <clears throat> and the third one is temperature. Okay. And temperature is, um, you should be familiar with this already since we're talking about enzymes, right? You guys know enzymes are proteins that catalyze reactions in biochemical pathways, and they're very, very sensitive to, to several things, among these temperature, right? If you increase the temperature too much, you could denature the enzyme, right? So uh, at a certain point, right, in a plant, you could raise the temperature and you could increase the rate of photosynthesis. So uh, you can optimize uh, the, the photosynthesis rate. But if you go over that particular, if I can say tolerance range of temperature for particular enzymes, the rate of photosynthesis will actually go down because you are starting to denature all the enzymes, right? So in this case, um, uh, there is no, you know, plateau here. It's just, uh, you gotta have that, <clears throat> um, that ideal temperature that is optimum for enzymes, right? So a little bit is okay, but too much isn't, right? You don't want to go out of the toler tolerance ranges of, of enzymes. So, um, denaturation is important in terms of temperature, but also um, temperature affects collisions, right? So of course, there's more molecular movement between substrates and enzymes. So as temperature increases, increases, collisions increase. That means there's more kinetic energy. There's more molecular interactions that are occurring between substrates and enzymes and other molecules that are, that are um, working in this whole process and, um, and so forth. But again, if you have too much um, uh, enzymes, uh, sorry, if you have too much temperature that is too high, then even bonds will start to break. In particular, hydrogen bonds uh, that are kind of sustaining protein molecules and enzymes and um, uh, uh, different molecules held together, they can be disrupted. So um, they won't function as efficiently. So ultimately the reaction rate will decrease, basically denaturation, okay? And um, and lastly, another way that temperature can affect photosynthesis rate is um, water. If you increase the temperature too much, water will start to evaporate, right? So um, if it gets too hot, the plant itself will start to close the stomata, the little mouths that are on the leaves, the little openings. Uh, this happens a lot with hot, dry conditions, right? in hot and dry conditions where plants, they close their stomata, right? To conserve water. And if you, if you um, um, close the stomata, carbon dioxide can't come in, right? Water vapor can't come in. Um, it usually gets released, but um, uh, yeah, moreover carbon dioxide can't come in. So you're decreasing kind of the reaction rate. So, um, Different plants have adapted mechanisms that we're going to talk about 
uh, to avoid this kind of inefficiency, like in deserts. So uh, we'll see that uh, later. But um, just understand that temperature, again, and carbon dioxide and light are factors that influence the rate of reactions. Okay. Uh, with that being said, that finishes this topic on ATP and photosynthesis. Uh, I hope this was clear. If you have any questions, you can um, um, ask me in the class on Thursday when we come back. Okay. Uh, if not, guys, um, we'll continue on with cellular respiration. And um, uh, we're at good pacing. So we'll have some, some good amount of labs that we can do with these two topics. All right, guys, let me stop sharing here. And that's it for today.